introduce um, Dr. Kabamba. So in addition to his PhD, Dr. Kabamba has a bachelor's degree in mathematics and physics, a second bachelor's degree in philosophy, three master's degrees in philosophy, um, and a master's degree in developmental studies. So I just wanted to let you know he has a wide array of, of expertise. Um, and with his field work, Dr. Kabamba has aimed to answer questions surrounding the absence of the of effective state sovereignty and national government, and who might take over traditional governmental roles in this absence. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Obama. Thank you very much. Um, I used to be a Jesuit. I was trained to be a Jesuit. You all know what a Jesuit is. And when I was a Jesuit, they told us to start speech by op an opening joke. <laughs> so I have two opening jobs. The first one, uh, I did my PhD in anthropology at Columbia University. And because of my name, they thought they were receiving for the first time an African woman. Yeah. <laughs> so the entire department was so happy to welcome an African woman. And when I was there, it was too late. So. <laughs> uh, Diego said that uh, I studied mathematics first, and then philosophy, and then now anthropology. You wonder why all these changes. <laughs> it's easy. When I was doing math, that time, uh, aid pandemic was very, very high in the Congo. And we were told that mathematicians were particularly vulnerable to HIV AIDS. Do you know why? No? No. The answer is that because mathematicians sleep with an unknown every night. <laughs> the X, you know, when you do your equation. <laughs> and then you catch it. <laughs> so I left math to go to philosophy. What was very interesting in philosophy, I was doing philosophy in, in Brussels, in uh, Louvain, in Belgium. During the time, I was studying Heidegger, trying to see in being and time, how can we found Heidegger as an individual, not the thinker, but the living person. I was, so, I was trying to understand this being and time while they were fighting in the Congo. So all the news I got from home was rape, killings, and yet I was concentrated into the design, the anthology. So it was a complete, complete disconnection. That's why I, I told myself, okay, I should do something, philosophy, I like it, but it should be a philosophy outdoor. A philosophy which is not only talking to philosophers, a philosophy which goes out of canonical text. This is called anthropology. <laughs> so you are in a very important discipline in the sense that we try to understand things, but for people. We are not just so close in, uh, in our, our ivory tower talking to one another, but anthropology has this advantage of bringing philosophy outside the room. And in my work, one of the philosophers was, during my study, I uh, fell in love with one of the philosophers called the Spinoza, Baruch de Spinoza. Spinoza is a 17th century philosopher. He died, um, he, when he died he was 44 years old. And one of his major work is called Ethics. Ethics actually contradicts the, this dichotomy between mind and body Descartes were propagating during that time. So he, Spinoza is very well known on bringing them together, mind and body, in the same uh, kind of uh, the same understanding, in such a way that Hegel, who is another great philosopher, said of Spinoza, either you are a Spinozist or you are not a philosopher at all. <laughs> so he's, he was really very detrimental in the, in the 17th century, coming to the Enlightenment in the 18th century. Another thing which was very attractive uh, about Spinoza was that he actually refused many awards, including teaching positions. 
And Deleuze, Jules Deleuze said, this is the prince of philosophers, because he was able to turn away these awards. You know? Nowadays, people got uh, even a Nobel Prize without doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, but he turned away. <laughs> he turned away these awards. So these are, and he was, when he was 23 years old, he was banned from the synagogue because he questioned the authenticity of the Torah. The Torah is uh, the Hebrew Bible. And he was just 23 years old. So this, and he died working on glasses. That was his work. That was his, uh, was making money on that. So this type of philosopher, I mean, we don't have them now, but just to show us what type of person uh, Spinoza was, uh, I remember as a con the contemporary philosopher like Anna Arendt used Spinoza because she also was banned from the synagogue when she tried to defend Ackman. I don't know the story. So, what did I got from Spinoza? From Spinoza, I got the distinction between what he, what he called power as a potentia and power as a potestas. He used to write in Latin. Potestas for him is power as organized in the state form, discipline, order. Is the power of the authority of an unchallenged ruler. The state, the government, the order. This is what he called potestas. It's a type of power which kind of alienates people. It's the type of power which is fetishized into domination. You know, this is what he called power. And he recognized many institutions actually are organized in that sense. It's instilled fear, but people just accept it. This is the first understanding of power. But he said, power as potential. It's all the human capabilities, the human productive power. It's an elementary power which bring us to bring our unleash our creative power, our creativity. This is the major difference. So for him, power is what we have as possibilities as human being, what we have as creative being. So he, he just showed the difference between the two, that power could be understood as a cohesion, as a discipline, as an order, but power could also be understood as a potentiality, what we have within us. And in my thinking, I used uh, Nick de Genova, who studied Spinoza, but he said that between these two powers, power as potential is ontologically superior to power as potestas. So order, discipline, come behind this idea of creativity, a creative human being. Order should be at the service of our creativity. That's what Spinoza said. And so all my field work, all my work in anthropology, I try to show, to understand where people actually have gone from potentia, from potestas to potentia, where they express their creative human being, all their possibility. So after two years, uh, three years of coursework, like I'm doing, I went to the field work to study uh, in the Congo. What I wanted to study was that, okay, in this middle of the caves, what is going well? What can we, how can we point out that here really people are using their, poten their potential? And so I decided to study a group of trailers in northeastern Congo who are millionaire in US dollar amount during the war, the last 10 years of the war. So I try to understand what happened. Why are they doing so well in the midst of chaos? What sustained this enterprise? <coughs> so in a, a much broader uh, topic, I call them, this is a non-state network. 
This non-state network is confronted today in two, two narratives. All this neoliberal narrative of development. The neoliberal narrative of development is sustained by the state. You develop through the state, the state capital. So all these non-state things are look at it as very dangerous. You will never <coughs> develop outside the state. That's what we, they, they told us. The second narrative against which this whole uh, non-state network goes is the idea of this state formation. We have all this literature of state formation which put the state at the center of the entire development. So hence my question, are uh, the African networks, non-state networks, are there social capital or social liability? If you go around Africa, you will find places where, despite the poverty, despite the fighting, you have people who are doing really well. But what I saw that it was ethnically based, generally, or religiously based. So let's take uh, in Senegal. In Senegal, the Wolof, the Wolof group is a non-state network, but organized in such a way that even the president, to be elected, he had to go to Tuba, make some deal with all this Marabu, so that they could ask the Muslim to vote for him. So it's a kind of a state within the state. They are so well organized. But so uh, the Wolof are kind of linked to, I mean, to, it's much more religious, not ethnic based. So you have the Wolof, they go, if, if you go to the 20, I think it's 25th Street in New York, you found them all the, so you go to Milan and Paris, they still, so you go to Frankfurt. So this group within the state of Senegal, are very, is very creative. They could travel, they could bring stuff back home. They, so, and then you go down the, in Nigeria, the, the Igbo. The Igbo are very well known first for resisting the British in the 64 during the Biafra War. So, but they are very ingenious. They, if you bring your computer, they will open it and then put it back and then try to make another computer next to that. That's the Igbo. So in Nigeria, you have these uh, three groups in the north, the Hausa and the Fulani, who are very good in trade also. And then in the south, you have the Igbo and the Yoruba. So you have these groups within a, what people call fail or collapse state, who are really making a difference. If you go down to uh, Cameroon, in uh, western Cameroon, in uh, the, the Bamileke, in the Bamileke area is completely different from the other places in Cameroon. So this group of Bamileke is very strong in trade, and there's a lot of money circulating within it. This is within the whole understanding of people have of uh, Africa, of poverty. So you found this kind of uh, people. And then people are studied uh, the Nandi, that's in the Eastern Congo. In the midst of civil war, they keep on trading, going to China, Brazil, Hong Kong, Taipei, Jakarta, Dubai, buying stuff, bringing them through Mombasa, Mombasa, Kampala, in the Congo, sell them, and then go back with the capital. So they keep on trading, even though people are fighting all around. That was my thesis. So what happened? Why, why did they? So you go down the Kikuyu. In, so all over Africa, you'll find this, what I call this ethnic enclaves, which are doing far better economically than the rest. And so for me, these people, OK, they understand with this big narrative of the state power as uh, protesters, but the first thing for them is this creativity. That's the most important thing. So they try to get out of this uh, 
this understanding of uh, order as uh, protesters. So, yes, as I said, the Igbo, you have the three major groups in Nigeria. They are very well known in the commercial dynamics, you know. Generally, when you talk about Nigerians, here people are scared, you know. You never give your credit card to a Nigerian. <laughs> that might be true, but if you go back, <laughs> all these people have big houses, mansions, the, the, the money they invest back home, it changed completely the dynamism of the country. And Nigeria, since last week, have become the first economy in Africa. They've surpassed South Africa. So it's a, the Yoruba, the Hausa, the traders, and in Lagos, you found the Igbo factories, which are some repair computers. So now, uh, in the literature, you have two sides. People who support these networks, saying that, oh, these are really social capital, but people also who criticize them. So I'll go through this literature, and then at the end, we'll see the conclusion. So for some people who are in favor of this network, they say social networks are endogenous and non-state solution to the problem of state failure and the market failure. you find literature in that line. You have Peter Little and all the people who think that the these groups are really the solution to the failure of the state in Africa. And here you find many anthropologists and historians for whom these perspectives are founded on the role of trust. Many of networks work on trust, solidarity, and local institutions of credibility. So Janet McGaffey, Hassan, and so you find people who are in favor of these networks. You have some citations where states have failed, the provision of social networks is seen as a source of non-state order. In the middle, there can be a government without government. Social networks have managed to replace the state and the laws have changed to challenge the incapacity of the state and corruption. You found it in Magafi, in Magafi. So this, you have literature, literature which support this. And another type of literature support the other side. For them, these networks are really liability for the development of Africa rather than uh, social capital. So non-state networks are characterized by a logic of poverty, predation, provisionism that block the real development of the country. Students of political science and political anthropology see in non-state social network a danger to the formation of a rebellion state. You found it Bayer, Collier, Duffin, King, Reno, or Redmond. So you have literature showing that hmm, these networks really are much a danger than uh, you have citations, the pioneer of modern Africa, <coughs> the fraudster, diamond digger, the currency exchanger, and immigrant all found way to escape from the law, boundaries, and official exchange. It is through these social practices of fraud, illegal immigration, drug trade, that Africa is inserting uh, itself in the uh, international system. This is by you. So the idea is to show that you have both sides of literature. And I took most of this from, uh, from Mager, Kate Mager I'll talk about. So Mager, who inspired all this kind of division of literature, tells us that the remark we've seen tends to be very essentialist. What we need to do to understand, to go beyond that, is to study each network in its context. Then we could judge if it's really a liability or it's a social capital. So to just give a general uh, condemnation or laudation of these, it's, it's a mistake. It's essentializing them. Let's study each network in its own context. 
What does it bring? What does it take away? And then we could judge that uh, this non-state uh, non network is either a liability or a social capital. Mega brought of important for my study as an anthropologist is the entire idea of informal economy. Because these networks are doing what they call quote unquote informal <coughs> economy. The formal economy is when you declare your taxes and then you follow kind of the formal uh, way. This is informal, but this is how Mega and Hart understood uh, informal economy. The issue is not one of regulation per se, but of the form of regulation based on personal relations such as those of kinship, friendship, and ethnicity. So the problem of, it's not informal of versus formal, but it's a trade which is based on other types of solidarity than the formal trade. You know, you use a kinship, you use clan, family. It's not against the formal, but it's different from the formal. This is a new way of understanding the idea of informality. And that's, so non-state networks focus on the organizational role of social ties that shape economic behavior outside the state through a medical relation of solidarity and trust. If we go, I go to the shop to buy something, the, the seller will not sell me because I'm SIM. No. This is the formal way you go, the exchange, no matter who is coming, the exchange is anonymous. But this is another type of exchange. I'm hiring my uncle so that with the money he could send his kid to school, but he will never steal completely our money. It's a family money. So it's a completely different way of orienting trade. It's not informal. informal. It's informal in the sense that it's different. It uses different types of solidarity. That's, uh, that I found a very productive understanding of this idea of informal. Because generally, when we use informal, we tend to kind of be literal. No, it's a kind of difference. So that's where uh, I found made a very interesting. So this is the group I studied, the Nande, in Eastern <coughs> Congo, northeastern Congo, on the border with Uganda. This is the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and the group I'm talking about is Somewhere here, yes, in North Kivu, Mutembo is there. I spent uh, two years in Mutembo, in North Kivu. So, you all heard about the war in the Congo, no? Th this was, after the Second World War, the most devastating <coughs> conflict in the world. People don't talk about it a lot, but given the number of casualty, it's really next to the Second World War. And from a humanitarian point of view, the Congolese conflict has caused a level of suffering unparalleled in the Near East War. As of 2006, out of the population of 58 million Congolese, as many as 4 million died. That's the figures you found from NGOs. But figures are debatable. You know that. But you always have the precaution on the Congo that most of these people didn't die from bullets. Many of them died from disease curable during peacetime. So you can't go to the hospital, you stay with your malaria, and it becomes a dent, and then you die. So all these people, these figures were collected. Four million people died during the conflict, and seven million suffered from malnutrition. Three million were HIV AIDS positive. Uganda used to be one of the countries with AIDS. And many, one, according to the study, one, one out of two Ugandan soldiers who went to Congo was HIV positive. And they raped, they married, they had. So this, that's what could explain the HIV. Rape. So at least 40,000 have been victims of 
sexual violence, 2.4 million were internally displaced, 880,000 uh, have become refugees, and 3 million children were offered uh, to from Karma. She works in the uh, NGO, uh, Serve the Children, I think. Yeah. So, this is to show the humanitarian side of these conflicts in, in 10 years in the Congo. But what was very interesting, important, is that it was not only humanitarian. It was the fragmentation of the group, rebel groups. We have at one point, as far as, I think, 20 different groups fighting for, uh, to, for control of a piece of land. So in 1998, the country's territory was controlled by three main Congolese rebel groups, one in the north, the MLC, and then you have the government, and then in the south. You, we had a dozen Congolese militia, those who call themselves Mai Mai. These militia are kind of a local movement of resistance against other groups they consider as foreigners. So you have dozens of Congolese militia, and you have rebel groups from Uganda, from Burundi, from Sudan, who found safe haven in the Congo to fight their own country. And we have also the Interamo. Interamo are the one militia who are blamed for the 1994 genocide. We are commemorating now the 20, 20 years anniversary of Rwandan genocide. So these are uh, Interamo are in the Congo. But this guy, now they are still accused of genocide, but they were 10 years old in 94. 10 years old, how many people can you kill? I mean, this is my question, and uh, it brings me a lot of uh, fights with the people on the other side, but just a question. <coughs> so, and then you have the Democratic Forces for the Liberation of Rwanda, the FDLR. In the Congo, all these groups are in the Congo. They, we've learned since we are, uh, we studied the school that uh, the state is defined by the monopoly on the legitimate violence. Here, nobody had the monopoly of violence. So you should imagine a space like this, where nobody control, have the monopoly of the legitimate violence. The state could not enforce this monopoly, because the state could not control these people. Sometimes they were stronger than the national army, these rebels. So this is the configuration we have in the Congo. Then, in Butembo, in Butembo, Beni Butembo, there where I did my field work, it was curious. In the south of Butembo, Butembo is part of uh, North Kivu, you have three regions. You have the Ruchuru, Masisi, and Walikari. In Ruchuru, in 2005, when I went to my, for my field work, there were big fight between somebody, a dissident general called Kunda. He had with him 2,000 strong military. He was fighting the inter effort. So people were fighting. The Rwandan group, Kunda is a Tutsi from the Congo. But since all the Hutu came to the Congo in, after 94, so they created a conflict. Kunda was fighting the Hutu who came. So it's a kind of uh, the same conflict in Rwanda came to Congo with uh, Kunda. In Masisi, you have also the same. You have all the FDL were in the Masisi. And Masisi is uh, maj uh, the majority of the inhabitants in Masisi are the Congolese, but Hutu Congolese. So, and the Kunda or the Rwandan government tried to control uh, the Eastern Congo. The Rwandan government is Tutsi government, and the Eastern, the Masisi was Hutu government. So it, you have conflict. And in Walikali, in Walikali, what people did, they displaced people from the Walikali to be replaced by uh, people who came from, uh, from Rwanda to give more space uh, to Rwanda. So there were uh, social ethnic problems. So what I'm trying to say is that all the south of North Kivu, it was in trouble from 94, uh, 2005. 
people were fighting. In the north, Ituri, the Oriental province, there is a place called Ituri where you have two big, two ethnic groups who are also fighting. The conflict in Ituri was documented by many NGOs, the Lendu and the Hema. So in the north they're fighting, in the south they're fighting, but in the middle it was peaceful. Not only peaceful, but trade was booming between these two, this land, trade was booming. So that was my question. People are fighting in the south, people are fighting in the north, but here it's quiet. It's not only quiet, but people carry on trading. Why? What happened? So this was my research question. How, in the absence of effective state sovereignty and national government, there was no Congo government because they could not enforce the monopoly of violence. In the absence of national government and in the presence of these numerous armed containers for power, all these small groups wanted power. Traders in Butembo have managed to build and protect self-sustaining, prosperous, transnational economic enterprise in Eastern Congo. So what happened? That was my question. In this chaotic situation, how did they do that? So that's what we will kind of, uh, I'll try to explain. It took me two years of fieldwork, even more, because I keep on going there after the fieldwork, to understand a little bit what was happening. So what I'm giving you might sound, uh, okay, you go there tomorrow or you understand. No, no, it will take you a lot of time to get just to the underbelly of the real society, the motivation and the life. So first of all, the tempo is organized, is, it's like a, a warehouse where people stop. But with, among these traders, you have a very, very big traders who are millionaires. They have houses in Dubai, in Jakarta, uh, in uh, China. And they constitute a group. So I was interested in my work to limit my research on this group of millionaires. How come, what did they do? So, and, okay, so we call them G8. It's a dozen of import-export traders who are millionaires in US dollar now and who have gradually captured the social economic supplies of the London society. So what do they import? What do they sell outside? They import, they import from home to home uh, containers of goods ranging from, so they bring home textile, motorbike, automobile, spare engine, medicine, other goods from Eastern Congo, Persian Gulf, and uh, Southeast Asia. So that's what they bring home. But what do they sell? Agricultural products, coffee, potato, beans. But the most important thing they sell is gold, because they are sitting on gold. And gold brings them a lot of money. Why? Because from home, they put the gold into an intentional standard. They fly to Kampala, from Kampala they go to Hong Kong. That's where they sell the gold. With the money from gold, they leave some half of the money in the bank in Hong Kong. They, with the other half, they go to Guangzhou, China, buy textile, motorbike, many things, and then they ship them to Mombasa. From Mombasa, you have trucks bringing them to Kampala and into Congo. And I don't, as you may know, China is the biggest buyer of gold, China and India. I mean, this is a, a parenthesis. Since 71, when Nixon kind of divorced gold and dollars, the temptation to produce, to print dollar was high, so that dollar have used its purchasing value have gone down. This is the biggest, quote unquote, mistake in the history because money without, which is not sustained by a value, gold or platinum or something else, it tend to, to be multiplied and then lose its purchasing value. That's what, and that's the Chinese, what the Chinese have understood. They buy all the gold and one day 
you will see that they, they will have disparity between gold and so the land traders sell the gold in China most mostly. And then they, they come back. But socially, I ask these people, listen, how do you operate? So this group, this small group, have demonstrated a great level of internal cohesion and trust between them. And then an example of trust, uh, I asked one, one of the traders who told me that he was bankrupt, and then he borrowed $40,000 to another trader. And my question was, did you sign a paper? I said, no, why? I said, oh, but if you didn't pay back, what will happen? You'll be sent to court or to jail. He said, no. If I don't pay back, all the others will know that I didn't pay back, and that's it for me. So everything is built on trust. If one of us is going to, to Hong Kong, I'll give my stuff, say, okay, this is mine, and he will treat it as if it was his, and then sell them, put the money into my bank account. Everything works in trust. If you breach the trust, that's it for you. So this is, among this group, besides gold, they own all own gold, there is this trust among them. This is what built, actually, uh, that's what built this. Uh, so this is kind of the commodity chains of gold. You have the diggers, and then all the, all the gold end up to traders. And then the traders will ship them abroad. OK. Uh, how do they, why, the question, why in Butembo, not someone else? Why do we find this booming trade in that exact place? Not in the, West, in the West, where even the, the, the colonial power came to Congo through the West, the Atlantic Ocean. What happened was that uh, Butembo was already uh, a stopover for Arabs who were going to purchase uh, uh, with their caravan. They, they were going to buy uh, the elephants, what do you call it, uh, ivory. You have an uh, expedition of Arabs in the 15th, 16th century who are going to that mountain to get ivory. And with their caravan, they were stopping over in this village called Lusambo. So this village grew out of this movement. For these people in Butembo, the long distance trade is kind of a second nature. That's how the city was built up. It's go look for salt, and then come back and sell. So already in the pre-colonial time, you have this movement. So people learned that you could make money by going and then selling out there. So the long distance trade, compared to much more sedentary people in the West, in the East side, the long distance trade because of Arab was not kind of uh, strange to people. That's what, First, uh, and then the Nanda people used to go buy salt in Uganda. They crossed the Semuliki River with all the danger, and then come back. So it's a community which grew up because of the, hist the history of this Arab trade to understanding that going out to sell is not uh, as strange. And then during the colonial time, uh, Congo was generally was colonized by the Belgian, but the Belgian came with the Catholic Church. So we have three groups. We have the Belgian businessmen and the Catholic Church and the colonial administration. This was the Trinity. The colonial administration make, made sure that the shipment was going back to Belgium and they will punish all the people who do not obey. And the business men extract in the Katanga and all that was, they came to Congo to extract. And the Catholic Church made sure that people believe in heaven and then be quiet. If you are quiet to work, you go to heaven. So they make sure that morally people stay quiet to work in the, the field. So these were the two. But in Eastern Congo, you have some Baptists, the Protestants, who came from Philadelphia. They 
managed to get authorization from the King Leopold to go to uh, Eastern Congo. When they went there, they ran away here from all the secularism, the consequences of secularism. They wanted to protect African soul against the danger of secularism. But in their teaching, they introduced also all the scheme, the enterprise, how to make money. The first shop in Mutembo was from a Baptist. So they were in Mutembo on the border, but in Uganda they have big missions. So they would take parishioners from Congo, Eastern Congo, to go to Uganda for the biblical training. During that trip, many of these parishioners would go with a piece of gold because during the colonial time it was forbidden to extract mineral. It's only the prerogative of Belgium, the colonial power. But the Protestant managed to allow the parishioner to go out with this. They, they said that what they were doing, they would put gold in the, this tam-tam, nobody would see it. They could just go and then sell it, come back. So the idea is that the Protestant encouraged the entrepreneurship among the parishioners, contrary to the Catholics. That's uh, what I'm trying to, to say here. So that's what could make us understand that why this entrepreneurial spirit came in that place, not in the west or in the south of Congo. So this is a historical explanation. And the traders, when you question them, why are you doing so well compared to other people in the other region? This is what they, they have got from the Protestant training. One of them told me that they learned three things <coughs> from the Protestant education. First of all is the dedication to hard and honest work. So you work hard even if the boss is absent. Second is the demand not to waste the earning on alcohol or prostitution. And third, the importance of delaying gratification. This is, they say that this is what they got from the Protestant education. And that's what makes the trade prosper. These are summaries I put together after many times of conversation and many two years almost of hearing the same thing coming back. So that's how I summarize it. The, the last point is very important. To the, the big traders, the, the Kamungele, who is one of the most prominent traders, he pointed this that what I learned from the Baptist mission is to be able to delay gratification. Not to use all of but just wait. This is, uh, I mean, we can see some of the Weberian uh, idea with the Protestant ethic and spirit of capitalism, but Weber never made a causality between the two. No, it's a, it's, we can't just uh, take it too, too soon. But this is what they get from the Protestant education. And today, today each of the trailer is. In Congo, because of the war, the entire road network is bad, except to that place. Because each of the traders is responsible of 50 kilometers of road to maintain. And if on your 50 kilometer the road is not good, because all of them use that road to bring their truck, they will ask you what's happening. So there is a sort of self-control they don't need the government to come and control. There is a self-control. You have to justify to others why your peace is not working. So, and then, uh, so there is a sort of internal accountability. It's the only place in the country except the Katanga where the roads are good. The, okay, I talked about the protesters, but the most important person personality in Utembo. Utembo is a city of 600,000 people, is the Catholic bishop. Why the Catholic bishop? It's because in 1975, there was a huge fight 
among the Baathists. One group were, I call them progressives, they, they wanted their degree to be recognized by the Belgium, by the state, so that they could get jobs elsewhere than in the parishes. But the more conservative Baathists say, no, 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 we train you to work in the parish. They were scared. The reason we left the Philadelphia is that we saw that with this secularism, people were losing their soul. So we'll train these Africans, we'll give them jobs in our parish, and then keep all our morality. But of course, people, some people say, no, we, want, we have a good training, like the Catholic education is the same, we can teach in the Catholic uh, or we can work somewhere else. That was the fight. A group of conservative Baathists didn't want the degree to be nationally recognized. They wanted the people they trained to work in the parishes. Another group, more progressive, wanted to get out. So there was a big fight in 1975 where churches were burned. The person who reconciled the two churches, the two groups, were the Catholic bishop, Monsignor Catalico. So since then, he has become the representative of unity in the community. So the Catholic Church is very prominent. They have the university, the Catholic University of Brabant, next to the Protestant University, and many of these universities are uh, staffed by the traders. I once asked the bishop how they get, he was explaining to me how they get the library. He told me that he wrote a list of 100 books. And then he gave to each trader a list of 100 books and asked them, during your trip to China, to the US, or to France, if you may, you could bring us this book. And all of them, without exception, brought the 100 books the bishop asked. That's how they start the library at the Graham University. So it was really internal effort. So the Catholic bishop is very, very important. They, they deal with uh, the hospitals and uh, all the development, the development world. Now, after a year and a half, I thought that you have these two groups, the traders who were in charge of economy and the Catholic Church in charge of development. But I was wrong. There was a third group. The third group is the group of militia. These traders are millionaires because they own gold mines. That's the secret. In 1983, the mineral area was liberalized by Mobutu. So these traders bought gold mine from which they extract gold. But to protect the gold mine, each of them had something like 100 or 200 militia to protect the gold mine and also to protect them against all the rivals. Now, every time you see in Butembo a truck full of textile, you are 80% sure that you have AK-4700 for the militia. So the militia are kind of junior partners to the traders. <coughs> the, the traders bring security, and the militia are kind of equipped by them. So this is, there is a, an understanding between the two groups. So as long as the militia steer clear of that center and do not disrupt none the capitalist prosper, prosperous sphere of control and stability, then there is a correspondence between the two. So they, I was attacked twice by the militia. The, 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 the first time they took money, they took my bag, and we were in the bus, 50 people, they shoot. So, but they will never do it inside Temple. They will do it in the periphery of the temple. So you have these three groups. The militia are junior partners. So seen economically, the militia then look like the junior partner to the trader capitalists who ultimately have real production, not trade, as the base of accumulation. 
And only the only economic resource of the militia is the piracy of the arms. So on the periphery of Butembo, the militia operates. The second time I was attacked, I was uh, at 14 kilometers uh, of Butembo, coming from Kichasa. And four people just stood there, and they took my wallet, uh, everything, including uh, my laptop. So now the, the interesting relation, so I explained the relation between the militia and the traders, but there is a, a very interesting relation between the Catholic <coughs> Church and the militia. I wanted to visit Burondo. Burondo is uh, in the south where the militia have their headquarters. And a friend told me that, you know what, you should borrow the bishop's car. I said, why? I said, because all the militia, most of them are either choir members or altar boys, former altar boys. So they know the bishop's car. The bishop enjoy big respectability among this group. So this is the relationship between the church and this group of militia. So the social cohesion at this place <coughs> came from what I explained here. There, there seemed to be a very clear social and political hegemony of the non de bourgeoisie, legitimated through the church officialdom, premised upon not one, but several relatively mobile formations of violence that supplies the ultimate resource of coercion and that social order. So, this is what explains the social coercion at that place during where people were fighting. You have the traders with the economic power, the Catholic Church with develop, who deal with development, and then this third group of militia in charge of coercive power. That's what I observed. Uh, That's what explained the the cohesion in that space. Uh, so, yes, this cohesion, we could say that uh, when people talk about Africa generally or Congo, it's classified among what they call the failed state. For me, a failed state is a straw man. It's for media. It's a, I mean, what have failed? What they failed is the colonially imposed order of the states, as it is, with the capital in Kinshasa, so which could not control. So this whole thing is kind of is being destroyed. But now the formation, the local formation is becoming much more ethnic based. And the only success. The only success I've seen in the Congo is in that place. Yet, you have different understanding. So internally, the internal dynamism is that many groups want to do like Nandi, to control what they have under the ground. But this internal movement, what I call centrifugal movement, to go away from the center, from Kinshasa, is contradicted by an external dynamic, which is much more centripetal. We have the EU, the US, the, the, the Belgium, who want to have the state, the Congo, as one state. Hence, they will send peacekeepers. We have 17,000 peacekeepers, UN peacekeepers in the Congo. And they, want, they, they went there to restore a failed state. And in their understanding, restoring means to have a state as we know it here. And what they did was they organized presidential elections in 2006. We elected the president, but the war continues as if nothing had happened. Until now, it continues. And the peacekeepers who were there in 2003, we are now 2014, they are still there. So despite, for them, I mean, the understanding of state is to have this hierarchy, president, the minister, and the, but they didn't see the, the, the internal dynamic, which is much more centrifugal. But they came with this restoring the state and the centripetal kind of uh, understanding of the state. 
I make fun of them. I say, you know, uh, the best the building which is built top down, the best building done top down, you know what it is? In the architecture, the only successful <coughs> building made top down is a grave. No? <laughs> Does a grave mean? I mean, this is, this is the understanding of uh, People go there with an understanding of state, what it should be, <coughs> and of state as protesters. They don't see the dynamism of each group you found there, which kind of expressing their creativity within this chaotic situation. So that's, a, that's to kind of uh, come back to, to Spinoza. That is what we have as anthropologists of specific. We, we don't come with uh, what they call a truth, uh, superior truth representations, you know. That's different from other disciplines. Anthropologists, we just open up the world to people to see. I'm open up the call for you to see. I'm not pretending to tell you that this is the real truth. And that's what we have of specific as an anthropology. That's why I like anthropology. There is a sort of immunity of the discipline where we say we are not bringing the kind of the superior truth, like a physician, like a mathematician, like sometimes political scientists will bring. No, we are opening up the world to people to see. So this is a kind of what I wanted to present, and I will give time for questions. <laughs> And so all this change the, the social fabric because suddenly you have this group of millionaires. Uh, I remember one, one of the son of this man married uh, his cousin. This, this is an exogamic society. It was forbidden. But they allowed him to do it because he was successful in trade. So the entire trade actually start changing the the small, the small rural area into something else. Uh, we, we have a, a joke, uh, I like joke because many things go there. They used to say that 50 years ago in the temple, if you date a girl, she will ask you two questions. Who are your parents and where do you study? Today she will ask you two questions. Where is your shop and when is your next trip to Dubai? <laughs> <laughs> this is the mercantilization of the entire community. That's actually what is, uh, we can see from this. And where is it going? I really don't know. I have to go back there 10 years after, uh, from now to see where it's going. But what I try to underline for me is the creativity of these people living in a very chaotic Congo. Because when you hear about Congo, 
you know, never you have a millionaire, you know, in, in US dollars. So I remember giving this talk in Washington, D.C. at the Woodrow Wilson Center. People from NGO who make money by promoting Congo as the rape country, the capital of rape, and, and then to hear the Congolese talking about millionaire, that was really very too much for them. And they really came after me. They said, you are promoting a cartel with the militia, with all the, the criminal aspect of it. You know? And my answer was simple. Our militia, we call them the Mai Mai. But somewhere else, they are called Black Water Company contractors. It's the same logic. You know, if you have money, it goes with violence and violence. I mean, if it's good there, why not it should be good in Congo? Thank you for that um, really fascinating talk. And um, I, I do, as an anthropologist, I work on the, I write about the ICC and these indictments and questions of criminal responsibility. And, and so for a whole range of reasons, I'm quite interested in the, the ethnography here. Um, but I have two, two comments and questions. One, it, it's a return to the, 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 the very nature of the way that you're thinking about the, the ethos that developed as a precondition for understanding capitalist logic in the contemporary period. That's what I understand you to be. But uh, in part, I think what the, the, the question is pushing um, you to, to consider, because in many ways, the way that you, you've presented it, it seems as if there's a totality here, that you have an import of particular values that have been taken up, so the value to, to, to save uh, one of the basic principles, so de de deferred gratification, mm -hmm. the last principle that you said was relevant. Uh, what else was going on? Are there other principles that are in, perhaps not indigenous necessarily, but are particular to the social fabric within which this value might have been interpolated? So that, this, because the way that you're presenting it, it seems that there's a totality, the, the people took it on, and here you have a contemporary manifestation, and this is the way we understand it. But, you know, in some of the work that I do in, in Kenya and Nigeria and other places, it's clear that, yes, there are particular values, but there are also ways that on the ground, conceptualizations, whether it's, um, you know, witchcraft or, and, and even if it's not about um, uh, other cosmologies, uh, particular ethos that are not about Americanism in Philadelphia. So I wonder if you could, because I'm sure it's more complex than you presented, but I think it's worth um, teasing that out a little more. The, the second question, which I'll, I'll um, ask very quickly, I'll try to, is, is I think it's the, the larger question uh, that's connected to this paper um, or this presentation, that in, in many ways you've presented to us three units, the traitors, the Catholics, and the militia, as a way to think about um, the forms of cohesion, the, the why, why um, economic accumulation works in this region. But it, it seems as if you've undermined your argument, and I, I'd love to hear your response to this, because it, it presumes that these are separate units, the traitors, the Catholics, and the militia, and that um, you have this war outside there, but these people are able to proliferate and and um, and and survive and thrive. Um, but I, in part, my, the, what I am asking is to what extent actually what we have is an interconnected set of relationships in which the very people that are the objects of this study are fundamentally complicit. You know, yes, the NGO said that they're in engaged in a cartel with the militia. Perhaps another way anthropologically to frame it is to think about the interrelationship that they, they, they cannot exist without a mechanism, whether it's democracy or whether it's a militia. Uh, whatever the unit is, it's a, it's a formal enforcement of power that they're exercising, which is at the core of your argument, which I think is fascinating. And so I wonder if you, the, the, the question then is, um, is it not really a story about an economic extraction and the extent to which extraction is fundamentally part of 
the, the precondition of violence that allows the, 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 this network to thrive. Mm -hmm. And if we disaggregate these separate units, as you formulated them, might there be another way to conceptualize actually what is at play here? Um, and it's, so it's a provocation in a way, and I wonder if you can defend those units or if there's a different way of thinking it through. Yes, uh, even the, the potential protesters, it might look like the economy, but you found protesters in potential, yeah. and it's right much more, you found both of them, you know. And as you say, this is the danger of analysis. Analysis means tear apart, but fundamentally, you are in the same society. So uh, the militia and the traders and uh, the Catholic Church are working within the same society and making the, the social cohesion I talked about. For instance, the, these traders, why do they own the gold which is a social surplus? It doesn't belong to them. It belongs to society. What gives them the legitimacy to have that? Okay, this is the first, but the second question, how do they operate so that they are not questioned about this legitimacy problem? Every time, when the school, so they donate back. Yeah. So they could not understand themselves as rich without this community. Hence, they have to entertain this community by, the, by giving back. The hospitals are generally, the medication comes from traders. The school is staffed by traders. So it's really, uh, I, I just jumped because of the time, what I call the, the, the two space, you know. The traders have the space of engagement outside Dubai, uh, China, but also the space of dependence. Inside Butembo, when there is funeral, they are there. there is, so they want to contribute. So, but these two space, should not, one should not overwhelm the other. If you are too much inside, you, that's it for you. There's no way to produce, to make money, because you have to redistribute all your stuff. But if you are too much outside, you, be, you, you become firm. You know? So they try to make this balance between these two spaces. So, so it's, there is a kind of a responsibility. That's the difference from the capitalist here the responsibility to the community because it's inconceivable for another trader to understand even his richness outside this group which produces it, which helps him to produce it. That's why he's present in the funeral, he's present to, uh, to contribute, ready to contribute. But at the same time, he knows that because of all the structure of family, African society, he might lose more. It might be against the capitalist accumulation. That's why sometimes you found that the manager is an Arab. So he is part of the family, but he's not. He's a, so he could take a popular decision. So that is uh, how it's very complex, actually. And I have this book uh, yeah. where I have all the details of a trader, for instance, will hire most of the hired people, people who work are from families, family members. So the, the shopkeeper is a family member, the, the truck driver is a family member. This is purposely done. Because once you hire a family member, you subtract yourself to the duty to pay the fees for everybody in the family. You know that the father is working, he will have to pay. So it's, it's much more complex than uh, I showed it. I want to just analytically to show these three forces, but of course these are kind of integrated together. For the first question, uh, one of the, beside the Protestantism, uh, much more culturally, in the Nanda, if you go there, people are rich but they don't show up. They don't show off the. This is the major difference with other groups in the Congo. Why? Because in the tradition, you can own things, more things than the Mwami. The Mwami is the, the, the chief. 
except what you cannot have more is the number of wives. But you could have cows, uh, land, <coughs> but on one condition you should not exhibit it. So you are still under the Muami uh, patronage, even if you have more things than him. So this kind of uh, traditional way of not showing off can help them actually in the progressive uh, in the progression towards uh, capitalism accumulation. Yes, it's capitalism, but it's a specific type of capitalism which is linked to the community. That's the way I put the difference. Yes. This is a follow-up question. Well, actually, not a follow-up question, a different question. I wonder if part of your current work, and it is part of your current work, but yes. you want to hear your ideas mm -hmm. or your future work. Um, focuses on not the eight who became millionaires, but the hundred thousand or million who tried and failed. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you're being, if you are considered potentially thinking about those as non-state forms of organization as well. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, really fueled by hope um, rather than by um, kind of outward success. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a, that's that's the problem. I mean. This type of work is it, very ideological. I wanted to show that, okay, despite the chaos, there is something order, orderly going on somewhere in that place. That was the... And then now, once inside, you see that, yes, of course, these people are doing well, but what about all the others who are not millionaires? What happened to them? And the, the, the salary they pay is really peanuts, you know? You know, a, a shopkeeper who will earn $10 a month, you know? So you need kind of an outside, an outside power which could push them to more equality of... Uh, so, yes, I completely agree with right. you. The ones who are trying to become entrepreneurs, not the shopkeepers who have operating jobs, mm -hmm. just all the ones who, you know, the youth who are probably trying to Yes, generally there is initiation, you know, they will send youth, but there are also there are a lot of competition. It's right. a competitive... And, that, and that's precisely the violence, I and mean, that's what the violence is in part about. Yeah. It's about the, in, in the region, on, in, on the other side of the, the road that seems mm -hmm. to be non-violent. So that, that those that are failing are contending, they're contesting for control of the minds and the resources. No, 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 I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, well, you can talk about that. I don't know. You have a question? Yes, yeah, so this sort of ruins a little bit. Thank you for your talk, actually. Um, I'm not sure whether I have a fully formed question. I'm trying to think through um, whether your analytic that you presented here could be useful in other kinds of contexts. Um, so I'm working with uh, sort of networks of, of capoeira, so Brazilian martial art in West Africa. Um, and there, there isn't the same um, like capitalist accumulation aspirational aspect to it, um, but there is these sort of like very informal networks between five or six countries in the region where people have managed to have a job purely by having these networks they can go in any country and be sort of protected and supported um, and make money um, and survive entirely off of teaching this Brazilian um, um, cultural, you know, phenomenon essentially, um, and they have this also this very like so. So what I'm seeing going on here is a way of you uh, uh, presenting a way of thinking of cosmopolitanism that's very different from the way that we understand it. So um, African uh, entrepreneurs having connect global connections outside of the normal channels that we often see it having to go through, right? And also. Um, cosmopolitanism sort of within Africa, right? Inter-African uh, trade and diaspora and that sort of thing. Um, and so that's something that I'm seeing also in my work, but not with the level of, um, of capitalist accumulation on, on the same degree, right? So it's kind of a way of sort of normal people um, surviving to, to the means that they feel are adequate for them by using these networks in ways that may seem crazy to us, you know, why would you aspire to have a more formal job, protection from the state, this sort of thing, if you're not, right, this kind of makes sense, you're gonna take that risk because you're aspiring to be a millionaire and that's 
potentially possible for some people. Um, but instead, there's this other thing going on where people aren't really gaining so much in the way of, of money and wealth, um, but these social networks and informal networks and cosmopolitan networks, both in, you know, with Brazil, France, um, and across the, the African continent, are sustaining this um, community or this network. So, um, yeah, I'm just trying to think it through with that as well. Yes, there is a sort of transnationalism which is make, made possible by the fact that uh, the state is a predatory state. Uh, the Congo was conceived as an extractive space by King Leopold in 1885. And it, remain, it has remained the same, except that the, manager, the managers have changed. Because even today, the Congo as a state is shipped raw material. We have, it's very interesting, 90% uh, of the country live on informal economy. You know, you sell stuff and then, but we have an intensive industry of gold, of uh, uh, copper, of uranium, and we generate billion, but this billion never stay in the country. You know, a few people benefit that in the capital, but you have these two parallel economies. In a normal situation, an industry will subcontract to people who will hire the locals so the money could trickle down. But we don't have that. But in front of this, you could just sit and complain, but say, no, listen, we control this. We can go, and the advantage they have, I didn't say that, ethnically, the Nande, you have to find also the Nande in Uganda. They were divided through a treaty between the British and the Belgian. So you have both sides of the frontier, the same ethnic group. So there is no linguistic barrier crossing them. That's another specificity. So I mean, to make it more complicated, another specificity. So it's a, that's where for me, I, I kind of, I didn't go into, I know what's happening. There are a lot of injustice inside. But the, the idea that, People will not stand and just let themselves consume by this super meta organization of state, which is kind of corrupt. Which, but they say, okay, they took things on their own hand. How? It's not perfect, of course. They are talking about militia or the attacks. It's not perfect. But the idea that you know you could get out from this, what is presented as the model, as the meta narrative. That's where uh, kind of my, my focus was. Of course, as an anthropologist, I could show what's going wrong in this, what a quote unquote, successful community. You know? The proof is that I nearly, I've nearly been killed twice with all these guns coming. You know? it's a, so it's not a perfect place, but if you see it at the angle of uh, Something which is given, the state, organization, is taken as a given, instead of being built from bottom up. That's what they're doing. So that's, they are taking themselves out of this understanding of order, as, as a state, as a, the unchallenged sovereignty. You know? that's, that's where also Spinoza is very interesting. For him, sovereignty is an inalienable quality of human being. It's not the state sovereign, it's human sovereign. We are sovereign, instead that we are creative. So that's where I kind of, I try to place uh, my thinking in this work presentation. Well, if we have any remaining questions, perhaps we can come up and talk to you personally. So thank you so much for your interview.